Okay, so welcome to another session of the blockchain course. I'm sorry again for the delay today. And we're going to talk about a centralized ledger today. So last time we talked about the concept of a transaction. We saw that the transaction will have inputs and outputs. And we saw that basically anyone on the network who sees a transaction can verify whether that's a valid transaction or not, as long as they know the history of the transactions until that point in time. And then the problem, of course, was that uh, we had this concept of double spending. And even though no one could spend the same coin twice, we had a problem that if someone attempted to do a double spend, then we would have different nodes of the network having completely different viewpoints about which transaction is actually valid and which transaction is not. And so double spending gets us to the problem of reaching a consensus. So we need to make sure that all the nodes on the network have the same history and believe in the same history of transactions. And of course, the simplest way to reach consensus is to just take some centralized entity, take a central bank, and just say whatever the bank says is correct. Okay? So when I'm talking about a centralized ledger, which is the first topic today, we say that there is a central bank. And let's call that central bank CB or just B, it's a bank. And what this bank does is that it keeps track of all the transactions. Okay, that keeps track of the history of transactions, let's say. But it should also publish this history. So it's not just that the bank is keeping track of the history, but also publishes it. Okay. Now we have a problem uh, with, of course, trusting this centralized entity. But let's say that the central bank is there. I'm not going to remove the central bank just now. Assuming that the central bank is there, let's just try to mitigate the effects of centralization. And let's just try to somehow limit the powers of the central bank. At the end of this process, we will completely remove the central bank and we will have a decentralized system. But for now, I just want to limit the powers. So I want you to think of two things at the same time. On the one hand, think of how you use cash and what kind of uh, security properties you have when you're using cash. And on the other hand, think of how you use your bank account and what happens with your bank account, okay? So with cash actually, you have a lot of anonymity and we don't have a problem of anonymity here because we've already solved that. We saw that instead of using your real world identity, you can just generate a key and use that key as your identity. Okay. But what does this bank actually do? So how do I create a history of transactions? Well, I can just say that, first of all, let's group all of my transactions into a bunch of blocks. And this is mostly just to make the implementation easier. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that a block is just a set of transactions. Okay. And actually, I, I actually want the transactions in a block to have an order. So let's say a block is simply a sequence of transactions. And I want every block to have some fixed size. So 
I say of size at most B. And well, in Bitcoin, this is 1 million bytes. Okay. So every block is just a sequence of transactions. And the way we save this sequence is irrelevant right now, but I can actually save my transactions into a block in a Merkle tree. But how does the central bank actually, uh, I don't need the name at all. How does the central bank actually publish the history? Well, the central bank just creates a bunch of blocks. And the idea is that the first block is just a standard block that let's say is empty, has no transactions. So let's call this one B0. That's why I didn't want to use B for the bank. And then every block after that will have a pointer to the previous block. And this is, of course, a hash pointer. So as the central bank, what I do is that I'm also on the network and I see the transactions that people are making. And whenever someone makes a transaction, they will not just send the transaction to the bank, they will give the transaction to anyone else on the network and then everyone would just use the gossip protocol to propagate this transaction through the entire network, okay? Now, why are we doing that? Because I don't want the bank to know the, uh, the identity of the person who's making a transaction. And if that person has to send a transaction directly to the bank, there are all sorts of other information that can be leaked. Maybe the bank can know your IP address. Maybe they can know uh, some extra information about what kind of browser you were using. So instead of sending your data to the bank, we have a network of nodes. And let's say one or several of these nodes actually belong to the bank. And when you want to do a transaction, you just create your transaction as in the previous session. So you specify the inputs of the transaction, the outputs of the transaction, all the other information, you sign it. And instead of giving it to the bank, you just send it to any node in the network. And then that node sends it to all of its neighbors, all of the nodes that are connected to it and so on. Until eventually the transaction makes its way to the bank. Now the bank just creates blocks. So the bank just listens for a lot of transactions. And when it hears enough transactions, let's say every block needs to have a hundred transactions or whatever. When the bank has enough transactions, it creates a new block. And then this new block that I create, let's say now I'm creating block number three. So it will have a bunch of transactions in it, but it will also have a pointer to the previous block. And then the bank publishes this block. Okay. Now we have several problems here. And some of them are actually solved based on this idea uh, of having a ledger like this in the previous session. Some of them are a little bit trickier. Well, first of all, how do I know if the bank has actually created a particular block? Okay. How to know if some block BI was created by the central bank? The other question is, of course, how should I, how can I trust this bank? How can I be sure that the bank is not changing the history? Okay, how to ensure the bank does not change the history? Now, the second one is already encoded here. So remember, we talked about this problem before. And basically, since the bank is giving all these transactions, sorry, all these blocks, and since every block has a pointer to the previous block, 
the bank can't really change any of the previous blocks without changing the current block. So if the bank wants to change something in block one, then the hash of block one will change, but the hash of block one is in block two. So the bank has to change block two and then the hash of block two will change and so on. So everything will change until the very last block. So the way I ensure that the bank cannot change the history is basically because I have these hash pointers that are encoding all of my history in my very last block, in a sense. Okay, but how do I know if a block was created by the bank? I can just ask the bank to find every block, okay? So this is very simple. The bank signs every block. Of course, this means that everyone should know the bank's public key so that they can verify the bank's secret, the bank's signature, but only the bank knows its own secret key, so only the bank can sign. So let's just review what we have here. We have a bunch of blocks, and each block is going to be a sequence of transactions. And all the blocks are created by the bank, right? So the block is created by the bank. But the transactions are actually created by the users. So the bank just gathers the transactions together, forms a block. And then this block, the new block that the bank forms, let me just form another block B4. What will I have in here? In here, I will have a bunch of transactions. I will have a pointer to the previous block. And then I will have a signature of the bank on this entire thing. So the bank takes the entire thing and signs it. And it publishes this block and it publishes its signature on the block. Okay. So now I have a very good answer for what the history of my transactions are. So what is the history of transactions? So what transactions have taken place? And the answer to this is any transaction that is in this chain is uh, considered to be a transaction that has been processed and done. And by the way, this is a linked list, but you can also call it a chain. So it's a chain of blocks. So this whole thing is a blockchain. Okay. So this is the first time we're actually using the word blockchain. This is what a blockchain is. It's very simply a linked list using hash pointers where every element in the linked list is a block. And of course, each block was a sequence of transactions. And again, in practice, the way I implement this is that this sequence of transactions is a Merkle tree of transactions. Okay, because... Later on, if I want to prove that a particular transaction is in block two, I want to be able to give a short proof. And if I save all the transactions in this block in a Merkle tree, then if I have N transactions in the block, I can give a proof of length log N that a particular transaction is in there. But that's just details of implementation. We already know how Merkle trees work. So, now it should be completely clear to you how the bank actually creates these things. So the bank creates a Merkle tree of a bunch of transactions that it has seen on the network, and then also adds a pointer to the previous Merkle tree or to the previous block, and then also signs the entire thing and publishes the block and the signature. Okay. And then when I ask what is the history of transactions, the answer is, a transaction uh, is processed, a transaction is in the history, if and only if it's in the blockchain. Okay, so a transaction 
is done or processed or another word that you will hear a lot is finalized. These all mean the same thing. If and only if it appears somewhere in the blockchain. Okay, now why does this solve our problem? So let's just look at it from the point of view of the different actors here. So let's look at it from the point of view uh, of the network nodes first, or from the point of view of a user. So let's say, I have my network. These are a bunch of people who have connections to each other. And the connection is using the internet. Let's say we have like a standard way of communicate. Uh, and yeah, so let's say I want to make a transaction. Let's say um, this node here, and I want to create a transaction. Okay, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, how the proof of each block is implemented? In this case, since we keep adding new blocks, the proof of each block has to be changed from what we have learned before. Uh, yes, so in this case, basically the central bank can add whatever block it desires. So uh, I'm going to talk about when a block is considered valid and when the central bank can add the block. But generally, the central bank here has all the power in deciding how to create a block and which block to add. And the proof that a particular block is valid is just that the central bank has signed it. So we're in a very centralized system where the bank can just create blocks. OK, so this is going to be the viewpoint of a user, let's say, someone who wants to make a transaction. So let's say this is the user and this is my network. And some of these nodes actually belong to the central bank, but I don't know which nodes belong to the central bank because anyone can join the network and uh, do message passing and the gossip protocol and all of that in this network. So from the viewpoint of a user, if I want to, uh, do a transaction, what do I do? Well, my first step is that I form a valid transaction. Okay. And we've seen before in the previous session how a transaction looks like. So if I want to send some money to you, I have to say, uh, I have to point to a previous transaction that actually gave me the money as an input. And then I have to give your public key as one of the outputs, and I have to say how much money has to go, I have to sign it, all the things that we covered in the previous session. So I just form a transaction, and then I just publish the transaction on the network. And by publishing it, I just mean that I send this transaction to all of my neighbors. So when I say publish something, it simply means send it to all neighbors. Okay. So in this case, I will just send my transaction to this person and this one. And then as a user, I'll just wait. I'll wait uh, until the transaction gets into the blockchain, okay? So I have to listen for new blocks. So I wait and listen for new blocks. 
and my transaction is done as soon as I see a block that was signed by the central bank and includes my transaction. Okay, so the transaction is finalized. when I see a block containing it. Now, to be more specific, I have to say when I see a valid block, because maybe someone is creating an invalid block and I don't care about that. So if I see a valid block containing the transaction, then I say my transaction is finalized and it has actually been performed. So this is the viewpoint of a user who just wants to make some transactions. But what if you're just a node on this network and you're not the originator of a transaction? So how does this whole process look like from the viewpoint of a node? So as a normal node in this network, you would constantly be listening for two things. You would be listening for transactions and you would be listening for blocks, okay? So I would just listen for transactions and blocks. Now, at some point, some of my neighbors or one of my neighbors is going to either send me a transaction or send me a block. So let's consider what I do as a node if I see a transaction and what I do if I see a block. Okay, so this is my first case. If I hear a transaction. And by this, I just mean that someone has sent me a transaction. For example, in this case, let's say I'm this node and this other node has sent me a transaction. Now, the first step is to check if this transaction is valid. So check the validity of this transaction. Now, what were the conditions for a transaction to be valid? Do you remember this from the last time? So the condition was that it has to have the right signatures. So it should pass signature verification, which means that anyone who's sending some money in this transaction should have signed the transaction because otherwise, uh, the transaction is trying to move someone's money without their permission. So I will just say this transaction is invalid. Okay. And then the other important condition was that the sum of all the inputs in this transaction had to be greater than or equal to the sum of all the outputs. Right. So this was the idea that you cannot create money out of thin air. The idea that if you want to burn some money, you can burn it, but your transaction cannot create new money. And so if a transaction is creating new money, we consider it invalid, okay? And finally, the most important thing was that we were supposed to say you cannot double spend, okay? So, no double spending. But previously, when we were talking about double spending, we said that you have to know the history of all the transactions that have happened until now. So I have to know uh, which transactions have happened. But now I say only the transactions that are in the blockchain are finalized. So when I say no double spending, it might be that I have previously seen another transaction that is using the same input as this transaction. But as long as that other transaction is not on the blockchain, I would not consider this double spending. 
So my definition of double spending now is a little subtler. I'm going to say there is no input Uh, or let me just call it coin. There is no coin that is spent in this transaction. And also in another transaction, that is on the blockchain. So as you see here, I'm actually assuming some sort of consensus. I'm assuming that even though these nodes might have heard a different set of transactions, they all have the same view of the blockchain. So this blockchain is what we have consensus on. And the reason I'm assuming that is because I have a central bank and I'm kind of trusting the central bank right now. I'm trusting that the central bank is creating only one blockchain. And since that chain of blocks is uh, published to everyone, I'm saying that everyone knows this chain of blocks. So everyone can just check if a new transaction that they're seeing is actually spending some coin that is already on the blockchain. So this means that a node doesn't have to just listen for transactions and blocks. It has to also keep track of the blockchain. Okay, so as a node, I have my personal copy of the blockchain at all times. And honestly, in the implementation, I usually also know which coins or which outputs of transactions are already spent and which coins or outputs are not spent. And so when I hear a new transaction, I just check these uh, local checks. I do these local checks. And then when I want to check that there is no double spending, I just check that the transaction does not use the same output as some other transaction that is already on the blockchain. Now, if the transaction is valid, I would just propagate it. So the next step is, if the transaction is valid, uh, I propagate it, which means I send it to all neighbors. Oh, and of course, I will have a small change here. Instead of saying, if I hear a transaction, I say, if I hear a new transaction. So if I hear a transaction twice, I would not process it twice. As a note, I just listen for transactions. If I hear a transaction, and if it's a valid transaction from my point of view, if I it's passing all of these checks, then I just send it to all of my neighbors. So here, I let, let's say on this node, I've heard this transaction from this node, and let's say it was a valid transaction, I will send it to my other neighbor. And as this node, I've heard the same transaction, I send it to my neighbors. Okay, now at this here, what this node does is that it first hears the transaction, let's say from this side, and then it checks that it's valid. And since it's valid, it just sends it to all of its neighbors. But the second time that it hears the same transaction, it just ignores it because uh, I've already propagated this transaction before. So I don't need to propagate it again. And so the transaction just gets propagated like this everywhere. And eventually, after a short while, hopefully, everyone in the network would hear about the transaction. And I'm assuming that the bank is somewhere on this network. So the bank will also hear about this transaction. OK. But this is how a node treats a transaction. 
There is another case for a node, and that's when I, I as a node here, a new block. Because actually the bank also, let's say this is the bank. If this is the bank, whenever the bank creates a new block and signs it and everything, the way it publishes the block is just the same gossip protocol. So the bank just tells all of its neighbors in the network, here's a new block. And then these neighbors are supposed to take this block, verify that it's a valid block. And if it's, if it's a valid block, they will send it to everyone else. Okay, so this is case two. If I hear a block, B, or let's call it BI. Okay, if at some point, as a node that is on this network, one of my neighbors sends me a block, what do I have to do? I have to first, again, check that the block is valid, and if the block is valid, I have to send it to all of my neighbors. So the gossip protocol is the same, no matter if I'm hearing a transaction or a block. But of course, the difference is in how I decide if a block is valid. So my first step is to check the validity of PI. Now, when is BI valid? Well, I have to check a bunch of things. First, I have to check that it is signed by the bank. So I have to verify bank signature. Because of course, if a block comes uh, from someone else, I, I would not consider that a valid block. The idea here is that in this centralized system, only the central bank is allowed to create new blocks and add them to the blockchain. Then I have to, of course, verify that every transaction in this block is valid. Okay, so validate every transaction in the block BI. Now, remember, I was already keeping track of the blockchain. So I had something like this, let's say this was B0, then B1, and so on. And I already have the blockchain until BI minus one. And so when I'm hearing this new block BI, the question is whether I should add it to the end of my own copy of the blockchain. And of course I have to verify the bank signature, but then I have to make sure that every transaction that is included in this new block is actually valid with respect to my previous blocks. So if a transaction is double spending, let's say, I had some coin that was already spent in B1, and now it's also being spent in B10. It doesn't matter if the bank is signing B10, B10 is invalid. So every node enforces this rule. Every node enforces that all the transactions have to be valid, and there should be no double spending. So even though the bank has a lot of power, it does not have the power to spend the same coin twice. And that's very important. So I validate every transaction in BI and I validate it with respect to the blockchain that I have on this point, B0 to BI minus one. I make sure that it doesn't have double spending. And of course, validating a transaction also includes checking these two things, that it has the right signatures, that the sum of inputs is more than outputs and all of that. Okay. So this is how I check the validity. And of course, I have to make sure that it's pointing to the last block that I have seen. So uh, I check that BI points to BI minus one. Now, so what I'm doing here is that I have this block BI and 
Every block has a pointer to the previous block. I already know that these blocks B0 to BI minus one are in my blockchain. BI has to point to the very last block that I have seen, okay? Because otherwise, if I don't check this, then the bank can create a fork, basically. The bank can say, as a dishonest bank, I create two different blocks that both point to the same block as their previous uh, block. And then the idea is that I no longer have a chain. I no longer have a linear linked list. I, I can actually branch it off. And we don't want to allow that. So every node, if it knows already the first uh, I blocks, when the next block is going to be added, it verifies that the next block is pointing to the very last block that was added before. Okay, so we check the validity of BI. And if the BI is valid, I now actually have to do two things. First, I add it to my blockchain. So I update my local copy of the blockchain so that I have BI in my local copy of the blockchain as well. And then I also send it to my neighbors. Okay, so these are the rules uh, or how the system works from the viewpoint of a node in the network. Now, I just want you to look at this for a while and see why we actually reach a consensus and also what kind of things the bank can and cannot do. So first of all, the bank can actually do a lot of malicious stuff here. The bank can, for example, create a block that has an invalid transaction in it. But if that happens, then that block will be rejected by everyone on the network. So no one on the network will accept a block that has a transaction that is double spending, for example. So even if the bank attempts to create a block like this, first of all, everyone will know that the bank has attempted this because they can see that the bank has signed an invalid uh, block or a block containing an invalid transaction. And secondly, no one would accept it. So it will never make it to the blockchain, the copy of the blockchain that is uh, saved by every node. And then I can say the same thing about here. So the bank might try to fork the blockchain. The bank might try to uh, create like a tree-like structure instead of a linear structure by uh, manipulating these pointers and maybe having two different blocks that point to BI minus one. But if that happens, it's also something that can be found out, right? So there would be people on the network who see that the bank is cheating and they can also prove that the bank is cheating because I can provide two different blocks that are both signed by the bank and are both signing, both uh, pointing to the same previous block. So if that happens, I can prove that the bank is cheating. And well, in this scenario, we are assuming that we're living in a civilized system and there is like um, a court system or whatever. And we can also sue the bank if we can prove that the bank has done something illegal. So the idea here is not to say that the bank cannot do something ridiculous, but it's just to say that if the bank is doing anything malicious, uh, the nodes on the network can figure it out. And then they can either ignore the bank, for example, if the bank creates uh, a block that has an invalid transaction in it, then everyone would ignore it. Or they can prove that the bank is cheating. So if the bank tries to fork the network, fork the blockchain, then uh, the people on the network will be able to prove that the bank is cheating. Okay. Okay, so there is a nice question in the chat. Uh, 
can it slow down the blockchain if BI has to be validated with respect to B0 all the way to BI minus one? I suppose the checks must get very slow if the blockchain is large. Yes, that's true. Uh, but basically, I'm not really talking about implementation here. I'm just talking about the viewpoint of a node and what the node has to do. So I'm just setting down the rules of the protocol. In practice, every node can have its own implementation of the protocol. And the way this works in practice is that if I'm a node on this network, I would not only keep track of the blockchain, I would also have a, a set of all the unspent coins. So I will just have maybe a binary search tree that contains all the coins that are not spent until this point, all the outputs of transactions that are already on the blockchain, but not spent by another transaction on the blockchain. And this would allow me to easily check for double spending. So whenever I see an input, I just go in the list of my unspent coins and uh, I, I just query, let's say my binary search tree to see if this input is in the unspent list. So I would not actually do a linear scan of my blocks in practice. But that's just an implementation and algorithmic detail. And the way I'm describing the protocol has nothing to do with how you implement it. As long as uh, you follow the protocol as a node, the details of your algorithms are really none of my business as the protocol designer. Okay, great. So this is the viewpoint of a node. But now we have to talk about the viewpoint of the bank, of course, right? Because the bank is the other participant here. So what does the bank do? Well, as the bank, I would just listen for uh, transactions. I would not really listen for blocks because I'm the one creating the blocks. But I will also maintain uh, a copy of the blockchain. And I listen for transactions. And so whenever I hear a new transaction, I just check if this transaction is valid. But as the bank, I have to be a little bit more careful. So you see, a node, when it wants to check whether a transaction is valid or not, it just has to check that the uh, coin was not spent on the blockchain. But there can also be double spending inside the same block, right? So. I have to actually be more careful here as well. It might be that the, the transactions in the block BI do not have double spending with respect to B0 to BI minus one, but there are two transactions in BI that are double spending the same coin. So when I say validate every transaction in BI with respect to B0 to BI minus one, I have to say with respect to all those transactions and also the previous transactions in BI itself, right? Because I don't want two transactions in the same block to spend the same coin either. So very tiny detail here, but as you see, it actually makes a little bit of a difference because uh, when as a node, I'm verifying a transaction to see if it's valid or not. I'm verifying the double spending only with respect to the things that are already on the blockchain. But when I'm adding a block, I'm verifying not only with respect to the things that are already on the blockchain, but also with respect to the other transactions in the same block. Okay. But now we can go to the bank finally. So the viewpoint of the bank is that it maintains a copy of the blockchain. It also uh, maintains a new block. That it wants to add, let's call it BI. Uh, 
So, and let's say that the copy of the blockchain was B0 to BI minus one. Okay. So I'm only listening for transactions as a bank. I don't listen for blocks. Okay, so listen for transactions. And when I hear a transaction, what should I do? I have to, first of all, verify that there is no double spending, okay? So I say verify the transaction, but the way I'm verifying it is again, signatures, inputs and outputs, making sure it's not creating new money, but I'm also verifying it for double spending, but this time I'm verifying it with respect to B0 to BI minus one, which were the things that are already on the blockchain and also BI, because BI, is the block that I want to add. This is the block that I want to propose. And maybe I already have a transaction in this block that is spending the same coin that this new transaction I'm hearing is trying to spend. So the check that I'm making and that I'm doing as a bank is a little bit different. I'm not only checking with the blockchain, but I'm also checking with this temporary block that I'm creating myself and I have not published yet. Okay, so, and if the check passes, if TX is valid, according to this check, then you just add it to the block. So BI becomes BI union with this new transaction. Okay, and I continue this until uh, my block gets large enough. And now large enough really depends on your protocol. Again, in a protocol like Bitcoin, the block can be uh, up to 1, 1 million bytes, almost a megabyte. But I'm not going to specify it here. You can really choose any amount that you want. So I just say when the block BI is large enough, so when it has enough transactions in it, I have to do several things. I have to make BI point to BI minus one. Okay. Uh, so this is just to make sure that I'm adding it at the right place at the end of the blockchain. And then I have to sign my new block BI and then I publish BI and my signature. And by publish, again, I just mean that I'm sending it to all of my neighbors in the network. And that's it. That's how it looks like from the viewpoint of the bank. So putting all of this together, if I want to go all the way around the system, a user creates a transaction. The user has to make sure that the transaction is valid, that the transaction has the right signatures, that it's not creating new money. And then the user publishes this transaction. And by publish, I just mean that sends it to all of its neighbors. And then at this point, the user just waits. And our rule is that the transaction is finalized only when the transaction is in the blockchain. So the user just waits and listens for the blockchain and waits until uh, they hear a valid block containing their transaction. And when they hear that, they know that their transaction has been performed. And if they don't hear that, of course, that means that the transaction has failed and it didn't happen. And the transaction would usually fail only if it's a double spending. It would be very weird for a valid transaction to fail. Now, uh, when this transaction is published, the other nodes will just do a gossip protocol. Of course, every node is also doing local checks. So we will never let an invalid transaction go around. Right. So as a node, when I hear a transaction, I only send it uh, to my neighbors only if it's a transaction, if it's a valid transaction, okay? So that's what a node does. 
And then eventually this transaction reaches the bank. And when the bank sees this transaction, again, the bank also verifies that the transaction is valid. And you see, we have a huge number of verifications here. And the reason for these verifications is that we don't want to trust anyone. So no one in this system is supposed to trust anyone else. So as the bank, when I hear a transaction, I'm not going to say, oh, uh, my neighbor has already verified this. I will verify it again. So as a bank, I verify it. I add it to a block. And hopefully when the block is full, when the block is large enough, the bank actually adds the block at the end of the blockchain, signs the block, publishes it with the bank signature. And then the block goes through the same process. So the bank is publishing the block. Let's say it's sending it here and here. And then every node is going to send the block uh, to its neighbors. But again, we don't trust the bank. So every node is going to check that the block it received is actually valid. Every node is going to check all of these things. And only if the block is valid, the node will add it to its blockchain and send it to its neighbors. Okay, now we finally have uh, all the nice properties that we wanted. So everyone can make a transaction. And actually in order to make a transaction, you don't need to even disclose your identity, right? So to make a transaction, you can just create an account. And we saw that an account is just a, a public key and private key pair. And you can just make your transaction using this account, assuming that you have already received some money in this account. And you don't have to even communicate with the bank directly. So you can send your messages to whoever you like in the network, and then that person will send it to their neighbors and so on. It will eventually reach the bank. So that's a nice property as well. You don't have to communicate directly with the bank. And the bank is also uh, held responsible in some sense. So uh, the bank cannot, for example, create transactions that, that are invalid. So if you think about it, a real world bank can basically take your money away. I mean, there, there is nothing in the software that stops the bank from doing that. So when you have a normal bank account, your bank can just change your balance, right? They can take your money away. But uh, in this system, this is actually impossible because if the bank wants to spend the coin, the only way to spend the coin is to have a valid signature and a valid uh, transaction that is spending that coin. And the only person who can create a valid transaction that spends your coin is you. So the bank can create the blocks, that's true. And that actually gives the bank a lot of power, and we will talk about this, but it does not give the bank the power to spend your coin. And that's quite nice here. But some of our guarantees are not as strong. So, for example, this last one, making sure that we have just one blockchain, we are really relying on the idea that we have a consensus on the blockchain that every node in the network is seeing the same copy of the blockchain, right? Now, of course, the bank can create different copies of the blockchain. So we can have the same problem that we had with double spending, but we can have it with blocks. So what was the problem we had with double spending? The problem was that someone could create two different transactions that use the same coin, and then they could, uh, publish these two transactions at two different points of the network. And then half of the network would think that the first transaction was valid. The other half would think the other transaction is valid. Now we have solved that problem because now we're saying the transaction is valid if and only if it's in the blockchain and there's only one blockchain. But there's only one blockchain only if I assume that the bank is honest. If I have a dishonest bank, what it can do is that, well, Let's say I have B4, it can create two different successor blocks. It can create two different B5s. And then it can publish these two different B5s at, at two different points of the network. And then we will have the same problem that we had in double spending. So some portion of the network would think that the 
uh, first block is valid, the other portion would think that the second block is valid. So we will have a problem if the bank uh, tries to fork the blockchain and create two successors for a particular block. Mm -hmm. But if that happens, you can identify it. And since this is a centralized system, and since everything is signed by the bank, you can prove that the bank is doing this. So you can take the bank to court and sue the bank for it. So then that's the idea here. The idea is that since the bank is uh, subject to law, it cannot do this because it will be found out and then the bank has to pay everyone. Right, so that's the guarantee that we have here. It's not a very strong guarantee, honestly, because the bank can now do this uh, forking here. So ju just saying that, oh, we, we find out if you cheat is not the same as guaranteeing that you cannot cheat. So we would like to make this part much better. We want to have a guarantee that the bank cannot cheat. Okay, but the bank cannot create uh, invalid transactions. But here's one last question. Uh, we talked about when a transaction is valid. And we said that in order for a transaction to be valid, you have to show where the funds came from. So for every input of your transaction, you have to show an output of a previous transaction where you actually received it, right? But if I do that, the question is, uh, where did the money come from in the first place, right? So how is money even created in this system? Because according to, to all the things that I've said until this point, it seems like money cannot be created in this system. So now we have to also give the bank the, the ability to create money, okay? And we do this, uh, by a very simple change in the entire system. And the change is that the bank can create transactions that create new units of money. So when I'm doing this check, when I'm checking that the sum of inputs is uh, larger than the sum of outputs, I say that this check applies to everyone except for the bank. Okay. So the bank is the only one who's able to uh, create transactions that are uh, basically minting new money. And I make this change in every part of this protocol where I was checking the validity of a transaction. So if my transaction is signed by my bank, if the originator of the transaction is the bank, the transaction can create new units of money. That's how I solve the problem of not having any money in the system in the first place. So the bank can create new units of money. Okay, this is all good until this point, but we have more problems yet. So why aren't we happy with this kind of a currency? And this is actually what a lot of central banks are doing. They're like a, a lot of central banks are uh, proposing what they call central bank blockchains or central bank cryptocurrencies. And the idea is that it's a currency like this. The central bank has control over it. The central bank can create new units. And the central bank is the only one who can extend the blockchain, who can create these blocks. So they're saying uh, it's very similar to normal cash in the sense that if you look at a, a normal bank note, it's always issued by the central bank, right? I mean, Hong Kong is a bit strange and it lets some of its other banks issue bank notes as well. But normally a bank note is issued by the central bank, right? And also a banknote is anonymous. So it seems like we have all of those uh, functionality here as well, right? So uh, the money is originally issued by the central bank, 
but it can be transferred uh, between anonymous accounts and you can create an account uh, without really linking it to your real world identity. Uh, creating an account is just a key generation and then you can use those keys to do transactions. So it seems it's very much like a normal system of payment with cash, which is which is giving you a lot of anonymity and privacy. But the problem here and the crucial difference is that when you're trying to pay using cash, no one can stop you. So if I have some Hong Kong dollar banknotes, and let's say I go to uh, 7-Eleven and I want to buy something, I can just give them the banknotes, right? There, there is no other step in between. But here, actually, the central bank can stop me from spending my own money. How can it stop me? Well, the way I spend my money is that I'm creating a transaction. And I'm giving this transaction to the network. It's getting propagated, all of that. But my transaction is only finalized when it's added to the blockchain. So if the bank wants to stop me from transacting, it can just tell me, well, I'm not going to add your transaction to the blockchain. And actually, this is very problematic because the bank can then also find out your identity because it's very simple. As the central bank, I can say, either you tell me your real world identity and prove to me who you are, or if you don't do that, I will simply not add your transactions to the blocks. And this is effectively the same as uh, having a system of identification. So yeah, we have problems like that. And that's why we don't like a centralized system like this. Uh, your first homework will be uh, uh, published today. And in that first homework, you actually have to think about what the bank can and cannot do uh, in a centralized cryptocurrency like this. And I hope that you, at the end of it, you would agree with me that this is not a very good idea. And it's, I mean, it's better than having uh, normal bank accounts and normal credit cards that keep track of everything you do. Uh, but still, it's not going to give you perfect privacy. And for that, we will need to make the system decentralized, but that's the topic of the next session. Okay, great. So uh, if you have any questions, please ask in the chat. Otherwise, I'll see you soon.